The Bible clearly teaches us that God is a promise-making God. What an incredible truth that is. God is a promise-maker. And Scripture is filled with promises, but even more exciting than that is the fact that God is not only a promise-maker, but God is a promise-keeper. Do you know that God has never, ever, ever, ever broken a single promise He made? When it comes to promises kept, God has a track record of 100%. God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. Glory to God! For you know God promised me as He has promised you and promises to you who don't know Christ salvation. If you're willing to by faith come to Christ acknowledging your own sin and repenting of your sin so that you might be given the gift of eternal life. God has promised you salvation and He will keep that promise. Every single day around the world, people are experiencing and meeting not the promise maker and the promise keeper by virtue of Him saving them as they come by faith to Jesus. But how do we claim the promises of God? I want to explore that theme today, that question. I want to attempt to answer that question from the Word of God. Certainly you can most likely add to what I am going to say today, but because of limited time we will explore three different ways in which we can claim the promises of God. And I'm not talking again about the pink Winnebago. I'm talking about claiming the promises that God has made to us in Scripture. I'm not talking about the promises that we spiritualize and claim Scripture says that's what I will get because we spiritualize the text. I'm talking about what Scripture actually promises us. The Scripture never promised me that I would be a wealthy person materially. And my happiness is not determined by whether I am a wealthy per person or not. My happiness is determined by whether I have a relationship with God or not. For if I am penniless but I have a relationship with God, I am the wealthiest man in the entire world. Well, on the other talk, token, if you're the wealthiest man in the whole world, but you don't have Jesus, you're the poorest man in all the world. I really don't care if you don't believe that. That is what Scripture teaches. That is what is. That is a reality. I would rather have Jesus than anything else in the whole world. Because as a result of my relationship to Jesus, I will inherit everything that is His, everything that He will inherit in heaven. Everything that we gain from this world remains behind when we die. But what I am gaining in eternity will last forever. That is what counts. You know that there is a promise in, skip, in Scripture for every circumstance and contingency we face. What an awesome truth that is. 
the basis for our entire life of faith is found in God's promises. And those promises are the secret to the Christian's joy. If God has kept one promise, He will keep every promise. And what incredible joy it brings to me to know of the promises that He's still making and are available for me to experience in my life today and tomorrow and Lord willing next week and next month and next year. Are you experiencing the promises that He's made to you? Are you seeing those promises kept in your own life? If you're not, it's either because you're not a Christian, you're not a believer of the Lord Jesus, or because you're walking as a Christian in sin, in disobedience to God. And you need to, either way, whether you are a Christian or not, you need to come to Christ with a repentant heart so that it, you might receive the gift of salvation and if you're a Christian that you might be re that the joy of your salvation might be restored and your walk with him might be restored there are three ways that I will present to you today in which we can claim the promises of God I will say this as a preface to the message. God doesn't owe us anything. God doesn't owe us anything. And for those of us who think that we can come to God and tell Him what He's going to give us, is in and of itself a sin which must be confessed. You don't ever come to God and tell God what it is that you want or that He's to give you. He owes you nothing. The only reason He's made promises and He keeps those promises is because He loves you. But He's not required to give them to you unless you are in a place where you can receive them. I've heard people who claim to be Christians who say, or I've heard them tell God what, he want, what they want Him to give. What an arrogant attitude and what a misunderstanding it is about how we are to claim the promises of God. He owes us nothing, but He keeps His promises conditionally if we're obedient and walking with Him and we're finding ourselves in the center of His will, He's happy to fulfill those promises and will because He's a promise-keeping God. The first way in which we can claim the promises of God is we can claim them like Caleb did, with boldness. Not arrogance, but with boldness. If you look at jo Joshua chapter 14, I'm going to start reading in verse 9. So on that day Moses swore to me, the land on which you, your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed, listen, you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time He said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Listen, verse 12. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. He is claiming the promise with boldness, not arrogance, with boldness. 
Why is it that he can claim that promise with boldness? Because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. When you find yourself in the center of God's will, you can come to the throne of God, to the throne of grace, and with boldness claim the promises that He has made to you, and He will give you the desires of your heart as long as they're consistent with what it is that He wishes for your life. The truth of the matter is this, folks. I don't want anything that God doesn't want to give me. Because if God doesn't want to give me something, He doesn't want to give it to me for the right reason. He knows something I don't know. So as long as I find myself in the center of His will, as long as I am following the Lord wholeheartedly, I will ask of Him to fulfill the promise that He has made, and I will ask Him boldly to do so, not arrogantly, but with boldness, with confidence, with the assurance that He will do what He promised, because He is a promise maker, and because He is a promise keeping God. What an awesome truth. Let me ask you something. Have you experienced the promise-keeping God? Have you had God make you a promise and keep it? Have you experienced what it's like to know of a promise He made to you and to have experienced Him keeping that promise. Let me tell you something, folks. There is nothing more invigorating in the Christian life than to find yourself at the center of God's will, to know what the promises He's made, and to experience God keeping those promises in your life. What an awesome thing that is. If I am walking with the Lord... I can come to Him with boldness and claim the promise. Secondly, I can claim them like Abraham by faith. By faith. Romans chapter 4 verses 19 through 22 Say this, without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Listen to me. Here's the key, folks. This is how you claim the promise of God. Yet he did not waver through un belief regarding the promise of God. Wow! Wow! Did you get that? And then he goes on and says, listen, listen, but was strengthened in his faith and gave God glory. Listen, being fully persuaded, oh, that God had power to do what He had promised. That is why it was credited to Him as righteousness. He was about a hundred years old. God had promised him a son. He was about a hundred years old, from his perspective, as good as dead. And from his perspective, Sarah's womb, as good as dead. Yet because God told him that he would have a son, 
Abraham refused to waver in his conviction that God was a promise-keeping God. I have said this before, listen to me, faith is the medium of exchange with God. Listen, you go to the store tomorrow, and in order for you to walk out of that store for a certain, with a certain goods, what do you have to do? What is the medium of exchange so that you might be able to walk out of that store with whatever it is you want it? Money. Well, in heaven, the medium of exchange is not cash, it's faith. And when Abraham considered his age and the fact that Sarah's womb was closed, he still came to God with faith. And he exchanged his faith, listen to me, he exchanged his faith for the miracle. Isn't that an awesome thing? Do you want God to perform a miracle in your life or do you want God to perform a miracle in the life of somebody else? Then come to God with what is required of you for that miracle. Faith. That is how you claim the promises of God. If God said that He would supply all your needs but you've lost your job, will you waver in believing that God will provide all your needs or will you live with the conviction that He will because you know that He's a promise maker and a promise keeper? Will you allow Satan to fill your head with lies or will you make a choice to believe that God is powerful enough, true enough, faithful enough to keep the promises He's made. Glory to God. Glory to God. For He is a faithful God. Faith. Faith is how you claim a promise, with faith. And because you have faith, you come boldly to claim that promise. But, for those of you who have not trusted the Lord Jesus, those promises are not for you. It is not until you trust Jesus that many of the promises made in Scripture become yours. And then we can also claim them like David in prayer. Look at Sam, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 25 through 28. And now, Lord God, Keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promised, so that your name will be great forever. Then men will say, The Lord Almighty is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. O oh, Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servants, saying, I will build a house for you, so your servant has found courage to offer you this prayer. O sovereign God, O sovereign Lord, you are God. Your, listen, oh man, your words are trustworthy. That is my God. And you have promised 
these good things to your servant. Who's your God? Who is your God? Is he a man-made God whom you can manage? Is he a God that you have molded to essentially do and say, as if he could, whatever you want? I'll tell you who my God is. My God is the God of David. My God is the God of Abraham. My God is the God of Caleb. An all-powerful God, an all-knowing God. My God is a sovereign God. My God is a holy God, a righteous God, a just God. A God far greater than anything I can ever possibly conceive of in my mind, even if I knew and understood everything He revealed to me about Himself. That is my God. My God is a promise maker. My God is a promise keeper. My God is the God of the Bible. If your God hasn't delivered the goods, chances are your God is no God at all. If your God has not delivered, listen to me, then your God is most likely no God at all. If you called down fire from heaven, would it come down? It would. If you were a true child of God and you found yourself in the center of His will and what you asked for was in accordance to the will of God, who is your God? Is it the God of the Bible? Is it the sovereign Lord of the universe? It is, the, is it the one who has the power to speak everything into existence? Is it the one that has the power to cause you to breathe your next breath? How to claim the promises of God? Claim them like Caleb with boldness. Claim them like Abraham by faith. Claim, claim them like David by prayer. Numbers 23, 19 says this, God is not a man. You hear that? God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Not my God. He's a promise-making God and a promise-keeping God. No one, not one of God's good promises can ever fail. Oh, glory to God. And there's a promise today with your name on it. If you're a child of God, claim it with boldness. Claim it by faith and claim it in prayer. Give God the thanks and the glory that He deserves for He is God and you are not. Father, we are so grateful for the fact that you are a promise-making God and more even importantly a promise-keeping God for a promise made that is not kept avails nothing. You are a promise-keeping God. And you have promised that any who come to Jesus by faith, trusting Him for their salvation, you will save them. We give you all the praise and glory in His name. Amen.